you may or may not agree with uh, the route some women take, but there are women and, frankly, girls uh, that find themselves pregnant and they decide to give their babies up for adoption. Why would they do it? How could you give birth to something and give it up for adoption? Well, we're going to find out in just a few minutes. I'm Connie Hicks. We're coming to you from Barry University, the David Brinkley Studio, and this is Community Crossroads. reasons uh, uh, women or girls decide to give up their children for adoption. I think that the panel here has probably heard most of them. Ginger, I think I'll start with you. She is the Director of Legal Services Correct. for Families and Advocates for Children. children. And okay, so you're sort of a complete agency. You deal with the birth mother, the potential adoption parents, uh, check out the mix, right. make sure it's a good fit. Right. Why do women give up their children for adoption? I think one of the overriding reasons is that um, a financial situation that they're in or the family circumstances or their life circumstances that are going on at the time. Uh, they might be the mother of two other children and a third child in the mix uh, is more than they can handle. It's more than they can provide to any one of their child. All of their children are going to suffer if they bring another mouth into the home. They often do not have family support. They often do not have the support of the father of the child. And sometimes they're just too young to parent or, for their own specific reasons, feel like they're not ready to parent. Uh, this just occurred to me. I'm not familiar with the laws of the state of Florida. What are, are there different guidelines for a minor? Uh, yes, girl under, as, as under, an under Florida adoption law, if a, uh, a parent is 14 or younger, they must have the counsel of a parent, a legal guardian, or a court appointed guardian. 14 to help or them. younger, though. Yes, that's correct. They're actually emancipated for purposes of executing consent, 14 so and older. So at 15, they can make the decision on their own and come to you or someone else, but they can do that without? They can, but it would be prudent on the part of any attorney or agency to try to involve their family to make sure that one of their options may be that their parent can help them. Their parents may be able to help them uh, raise this child, so make sure that they've looked at that option. All right, let me, Amy Hickman is an attorney, and you deal strictly in the adoptive process. You, you do yes. nothing else uh, with this. Um, do you get often relatively young people coming to you, or do you find that at least because you're a private agency, do you find more that it's, it's a more mature woman who, for whatever reason, has decided that she should not keep the child? I would say that the average birth mother that comes to us is, is probably in her um, early to mid-20s. Mm -hmm. um, she's had a child before, so um, an abortion is not necessarily an option for her because she understands what she's carrying and what it's going to grow into. Um, and her financial situation and her emotional situation is such that, um, as, as Ginger said, bringing another child in would not be um, in the best interest of the child she's carrying and the children she has at home. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, well, next we'll introduce Nick, Nick Silverio. You are the founder of Safe Haven. Safe Haven for newborns. For newborns, which is now across the Strait of Florida. And this is a place where if you do not want to keep your baby and it's within three days old, they can take it to a, any place with emergency uh, medical services, but it's more often a fire station, a hospital, a medical clinic, something like that. <clears throat> um, and if you can briefly tell us why you started this, because I, I think it's rather thoughtful. Well, my uh, my wife and I uh, didn't have children, and we had a she had a fatal car accident caused by a speeding driver in 1999. Matter of fact, uh, tomorrow will be the December 7th, and uh, and so we didn't have children because we had two miscarriages, and I wanted to continue her memory and spirit, so I. Uh, created this foundation and we chose as our first project, Safe Haven for Newborns. And how does it work? Well, it works, um, works very simply. The uh, Florida legislature passed a law in July of 2000 that allows a mother to leave a baby at a fire station, a hospital, or EMS station. Uh, no questions asked if the baby is approximately three days old or less and, uh, and not abused. And, uh, and um, the, 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 we, we just had a situation, we have 57 babies that have been saved under this program. and. Um, and based on the, the letter and spirit of the law all throughout the state of Florida. And the reasoning behind this is that too many women, and I think they were usually very young women, were not married, did, did, had hoped their parents didn't know they were pregnant, and they were dropping or leaving these babies, I know, in dumpsters or behind mm -hmm. stores or things like that. And that was to 
Yeah, and this is to make sure that the child is taken care of properly. This is a compassionate approach. It's not, uh, it doesn't solve the societal problems that we have, but a uh, child's life is saved, a mother and father are saved from a lifetime of guilt and anguish and possible uh, prosecution in the hopes and dreams of a family waiting to adopt are fulfilled. And if possible, they try to get a medical history so at least that that baby uh, can, you know, as it gets adopted or goes into foster care or shelter care, whatever, can at least you've got some medical information of the family's history. Quite often we're not able to get that because of the cir circumstances, but we, we have a questionnaire that we now ask the, the mother if she's willing to, to provide that information. And, and if she's doing it in a crisis situation, she probably wouldn't do it accurately anyway. But if she's doing it over the helpline because she's called us, because she needs help, she more than likely will provide accurate information. And that's, we're trying to do that now. Do you find uh, then, Ginger, since you're dealing with uh, mothers, I presume, that are a little bit older, and, or at least with children who have been there a little bit longer, are they a little more helpful? or are they still reluctant to sort of give this information? Most women that are making voluntary placements, and that's what all of us are doing, Volunt we're, not, we're not taking Soliciting. children away. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they want to make an adoption plan, um, usually are pretty forthcoming with information about themselves and about their extended families and as much as they know about the father if he's not participating in the process. Um, actually, under the safe haven law, where we have an obligation to search for the parents anyway in the hopes of either having them sign a consent for adoption or maybe getting that background information from them. But I think when we pose to them the idea that this information is vital to the child's future, in other words, am I Italian, am I Irish, am I Cuban, am I, you know, what am I? Um, we can answer those questions. As an adoptive parent, you can answer that question for your child. And when we pose it that way, I think most women are very happy to provide the information. I'll ask you all, or, or certainly the, the attorneys have probably run into this, how often does a woman come back and say, I've made a terrible mistake, I want to keep my baby? Um, I think that it does not happen very often. Mm -hmm. We work so hard with the woman up front in mm -hmm. understanding her options and providing her with counseling and a lot of counseling. Most women who say, I'm so scared, I don't know if I have the strength to do something like this. I'm going to see my baby. I don't want to see my baby after birth and want it placed um, away from me. And I tell them, you know, it's really important. Work with a counselor, understand your adoption plan, prepare for the emotions that you're going to experience. This is never easy. You will grieve after your placement. But if you do that hard work up front, you will have a successful placement and feel that you have accomplished something for yourself and your child. And so you don't feel like something is taken away from you. And I think with that hard work under your belt, all the birth mothers who have done it have said to me, this was so much easier mm -hmm. than what I envisioned when I first came to you. Really? Because yeah. I had the opportunity to choose and meet the adoptive family to get to know them, for them to get to know me. I feel very comfortable that they're going to provide this child with a wonderful history of his or her adoptive family. I've given them photographs of me and my other children, maybe my parents, photographs of me growing up, a letter to my child explaining my adoption decision. There are so many options out there for a woman to set her own standard and her own process for her adoption so we don't have those changes of mind. It's when you make a quick decision and you refuse to do the hard work up front that you start to feel that level of regret and really grieve your placement after placement. Nick, I see you nodding your head. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly, <laughs> I, I agree. I, I'd like to share a little quick story to, to, to support uh, what, what she just said. We received a call from a, a woman, a girl. She was uh, 19 years old. Uh, she, um, the baby was two days old. She couldn't keep the child, and she wanted to know where she could take it to the fire station because she had saw our public service announcements. We uh, have handheld devices, so when she told us where she was at, we were able to tell her where she the closest uh, uh, fire station was. She said she would, she could get there by herself. She got there. We called the fire station. She left the baby there. The baby then was taken to the hospital, and we thought that that was fun. that was it. Uh, two days later, the biological mother called us on the helpline. She wanted to thank the helpline, but more importantly, she had two letters that she wanted to give us mm. to give to the adoptive parents, one for them and one for the baby when the baby grew up. So we received, we went to meet her. We met her in a church and uh, she gave us the letters. It was an emotional meeting. We took the letters. We contacted the adoption agency. They wanted us to mail it to them and we, we, we wanted to uh, give it to the uh, uh, adoptive parents personally because that's what we were charged to do by the mother. And we did that and uh, they were sealed. And the gist to the letter to the, uh, to the uh, baby was that you didn't think I loved you when the baby grows up. You didn't think I loved you all these years, but that's the reason I gave you up exactly. because yeah. I didn't have a future and I wanted you to have one. So we talked to that, uh, that baby uh, once a month. 
they happen to live in Kentucky now. And uh, she calls and she calls Uncle Nick and she's uh, three and a half years old now and she's oh, a, a sweetheart. That's huh. wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's a great story, mm -hmm. that really and is. And adoptions are going that way. More and more open where they're yes. having these opportunities. Where, yeah, uh, really and obviously I think that's a good, a good thing, mm -hmm. yeah. So, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we say give up, and I, it almost sounds like you're talking about right. a pet. I, right. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that term. Yeah. It's like I'm going to give up these shoes, they pinch my toes, I'm going to give up this dog, he's not housebroken, right. I'm going to give up. But So that's really probably the wrong terminology. It is. The term is. is place. I was going to say place, place, place your child for adoption. Mm -hmm. right. and, and the other thing is when people use the word abandon, uh, babies are not abandoned if they're given to somebody at a fire station or a hospital. That's right. That's they correct. What about, we've been talking about the mother, what about the rights of the biological father? How, how does that work legally and morally and ethically in this scenario if the woman comes to you or you or you and says, I would like to place my child? If a woman comes to me and says, what are the biological father's rights? The first question to me is, who is the biological exactly. father? <laughs> um, and asking her and trying to understand and to contact him. His biological information is 50% of who this child is. And if the circumstances are right, it's important to bring him into the situation. And when I say if the circumstances are right, we want to be very careful if there's domestic violence issues, mm -hmm. rape issues, and those types of things to protect her privacy and her safety. Um, but in the majority of situations, he is contacted. We discuss with him the adoption decision right. the birth mother has made if she has not discussed it with him first. And in the majority of the cases, she is. Um, we involve him in the process. A lot of um, birth fathers do not want to be involved. Um, they can sign off prior to birth if that's what they would like. Um, we really encourage them to be involved, to provide biological information. Um, if they are involved, they are involved in the choice of adoptive family, meeting the adoptive family, participating right. during the birth right. process of the child, receiving pictures and letters after birth. Um, I know that Ginger's agency probably does it. My law yeah. office does it. We A lot provide of our practice. Yeah. pictures and letters um, throughout the years um, based on written agreements so that um, adoptive families are providing updates to their birth parents so that the birth parents can assure that the decision they made, a future for their child, is being fulfilled in reality. I need to ask a question that's so on point to that, but I've got to take a break. So as soon as we get back in two minutes, I'll ask that question. University, your choice for all the right reasons. Almost half of all parents who suspect their child has a problem learning wait a year or more before getting them help. Why? When there's so much they could be achieving. Kids with learning disabilities are smart. They just learn differently. Visit us on the web now. You're gonna make it after all. The best way out is by coming in. Going to family learning programs helps you and your family lead better lives. Call 1-877-FAMLET-1. These kids are in trouble. They have a problem learning. And their parents are waiting too long before getting them help. Don't wait. The sooner you get help, the better the chance your kid has. Well, things have certainly changed over the years then in this process of placing a child. Um, and we were just talking about the father. What if the father hasn't been told that he is a father? What if this is something that's been kept from him and the woman uh, place, wants to ch place the child for adoption? Do you have to try to seek out? Do you have to get the biological father's signature or approval to do this? It really depends on his legal status. If he's, if he's a legal husband and he's married to this woman, we have to do everything we can to get his consent. Or if to he's give a him boyfriend? 
If he's a boyfriend and she's identified right. him, we do have to right. provide him with a statutory adoption disclosure and prove to the court that he has personally received that disclosure. He signs a receipt for it. Um, other than that, unless he proceeds forward to establish his parental rights and say, here I am, I'm dad, his consent would not be required. That does not mean in good adoption planning we're not addressing him, we certainly are, because that's in the best interest of the child. But in those cases um, where someone's committed fraud and not identifying the biological father and the placement has been made, there is a what's called a few, Florida Putative Father Registry. It's a place for him to say, here I am. I want my child. You're on notice. When do we know that he knows about the possibility of a child? At conception. There's a confidential registry that he can go to. Legal parents do not need to sign up on this registry. Just those who are not legal parents who haven't otherwise established their rights to make sure that any child that is a result of an act of conception that they've engaged in, their biological child, is not placed for adoption without notice and consent to them. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court many, many years ago said <laughs> that a um, biological father must step forward even prior to that child's birth to provide support, both emotional and financial, to assure and seize his parental rights. Because a birth mother is so frequently are in a position where they're carrying a child and a birth father will say to them, you know, that's your problem. You're mm -hmm. carrying this baby. Call me when the baby's born. Maybe we'll do a DNA test. Maybe I'll help you out. And she's got to make a decision now because this child immediately upon birth and even prior to birth is in need of financial and emotional support. Nick, why is safe haven only for rough t newborns, uh, roughly three days old? What's, what's wrong with a week or two weeks? Or, you know, I, I realize you don't want to get into the adoption. You don't want a five-year-old child being walked in you know, from their mother and going through that. But why three days? Well, ba based on the three, first three, three days of uh, birth are the most critical. And also, that's when, uh, if you go beyond those three days, then the bonding the, takes the place. bonding takes place and and the baby can be put through a traditional adoption beyond that so this is a this is the window of uh, of of helping a mother that's that's in crisis or distress I was say, it's crisis management yeah, it it's really, really is a crisis and, management and it's that period of time yeah. we're looking at the law right now to see if uh, um, uh, that period of time but uh, right now it's, uh, it's three days old or approximately three days or old or less Babies have been left been a week, they have been a month, they have been a couple months. And the authorities have looked, uh, been very compassionate about that and not pursued the, the mother. What kind of mother then tip typically would come to Safe Haven? A mother that's... Um, I'm going to that assume young and poor, but... No, and mm -hmm. that's not correct. Yeah. <laughs> the, the mother is between the ages of 18 and 22 and uh, middle class uh, so normally. Yeah, college education. Yeah. And, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm that they're all alone, they have nobody to turn to, they're, uh, they're pregnant, they start denying their pregnancy, they don't gain weight, and uh, they wear baggy clothes, and uh, they have nobody to turn to. I, I've done three, Nick knows that. I've done three yes. safe haven cases. One was a college uh, student, the second case was a couple, and the third case was just like you think about them leaving a baby at a fire station, totally no idea who left that baby. Mm -hmm. So all left it there without, yeah, when no one was around Three scenarios, three very different scenarios, mm -hmm. and they all used mm -hmm. the safe haven uh, law to, to protect their child. As a rule of thumb, uh, do, does your agency, for example, what age range of children? We work with newborns primarily because most voluntary placements are, are babies and infants. It's very difficult, as we were just yes. talking about, for you to voluntarily place your three-year-old. You've had right. three years of bonding. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had people approach us, but we find out most of the time they don't go through with the adoption. And, and those who the children are older, the three or the five or the six-year-old children, they would go to Department of Children and Families, I assume? They or? should go for services. They should see what services can be provided to them by the state to maybe help them continue to parent. That's usually the goal. And is that the same with you, Amy, also newborns? or Absolutely. Um, when you're looking at placing an older child, um, you really need to access services that a private agency or attorney cannot provide. We have done older children placements, mm -hmm. um, but it's in very unique situations. They're very, very few and far between. Um, and it's in those cases where um, the birth mother really has had an opportunity to explore her options mm -hmm. and felt that um, she wouldn't be able to parent any further. Very unique, more open situations, um, a lot yeah. of contact between the adoptive family and the birth mother. They almost turn into extended family type situations. You have to transition the child. You can't take a three-year-old away from its mother, yeah. place yeah. it in another. So yeah. you have to go through a transition period exactly. for that child, and they're, they're usually pretty open. It's almost a co-parenting period. Yes, exactly. Yeah. We, we've had mothers as young as 14 and as, and as old as 39. 
Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, so much for the stereotypical view exactly. of exactly. someone that would do that. How, how did you, you'd mentioned earlier, uh, Amy, that you know, you know when uh, something's not going to work. So, what are the signs of a woman that really should be giving up, uh, should be placing her baby, you know, and the sign or, or, you know, of someone who isn't quite there yet. This is not something they're comfortable with. What do you look for? And th this is open to any of you. I think a lot of it's in their counseling um, and in their focus on what they're looking for in their adoption and creating their plan. Are they working on their plan? Are they working with their counselor to, to, to really try to develop a plan? Are they establishing a relationship with the adoptive family during their period of their pregnancy? Or are they just focused on what, what financial compensation is available to them? The law does allow us to assist women with living expenses, those bare living expenses you can't afford because of your pregnancy. A lot of women um, are engaged in um, jobs where they can't work during their pregnancy, so we're allowed to assist them to the extent that they had those needs. And if that's their only focus, it starts to raise red flags. I think the longer mm -hmm. that you do this, you start to get a second sense of what the red flags are. <laughs> and yeah. I always tell a client, if you look at a situation, it's going to have an issue in it. If it doesn't have an issue, it's probably too good to be true. Mm -hmm. It's really working through those issues, trying to establish consistency. I think if they're compliant, because what you do is try to have this bilateral arrangement where we're going to provide this, this, and this for you, and this family is going to embrace this child and they're ready and all of this, but what the mother needs to do is go to the doctor, to get her prenatal yes. care, be honest about what her needs are, not have crisis after crisis. When we get crisis after crisis, all our antenna go up mm -hmm. because we know something else is going on. And most women are. Yeah. I, I think we're here to say that most women are. So you're dealing a lot with pregnant women, not women who've already given birth, but women who are still pregnant. Right. The majority. But, but, majority. No, but have decided. How many of those women that have decided that they ought to have their child put up for adoption change their mind once the child is born? I'd say about 15%. I was going to say 10. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Depends. 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. It depends. I don't think there's any statistic no. on it. I think I'm that smiling. We don't have one yeah. for two years, and then yeah. we'll have two in one, one year. year. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. You know, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and I think that it's, it's a difficult thing to do. I mean, somebody who truly has a change of heart, it's just an acknowledgment that it's a difficult thing to do. And um, that's why consents are not signed till after birth, um, because you have to be able to see your baby and have a waiting period after birth to continue to say, is this the right decision for me and my child? I think one of the things with counseling that we're referring to is not counseling that they should do an adoption plan. It's the counseling is how to get through the process if this is a good decision. Mm -hmm. If it's really in their child's best interest, then we're gonna give them grief counseling yes. or, or prepare them for the grief and then give them grief counseling. A lot of the counseling is how do I tell my other children I have a six-year-old that knows yes. I'm pregnant? How do I tell them at work when I come back and I don't have the baby? What do I do with my grandmother that doesn't agree? What do I do with a father that's in a power struggle with so me? So if I understand you, you're saying the counseling isn't so much, so here are the steps to adoption, but no. here are the steps you need to go through well, or expect or anticipate. You have to Most, explain the process. Yeah. You have well, to explain uh, the yes, process. but I was trying yeah. to, yeah. you're focusing then too on this is what your day-to-day -day life is going to be like. Here are things we can help you with. Here are things you may go through. Mm -hmm. A woman doesn't step into the adoption process really and start to, to match with an adoptive family until she's made her own independent decision. Exactly. Her pros and cons list, this is the right decision for me, my child, and my family. The counseling is there to say, exactly mm -hmm. as Ginger said, mm -hmm. how am I going <clears throat> to implement my plan? Um, what role do I want the adoptive mother and father to play during my hospital stay? Um, what is my contact with the child going to be during my hospital stay before mm -hmm. I sign consents? All the different factors that say, you know what, when I sign this consent, I feel comfortable that I've made the right decision and I've done it on my terms and I feel healthy about the way that it's done. Is there any rule of thumb or again, does it vary depending on the people? Do you have better success rates with a adopting family bonding with, with the birth mother or is it better if they're kept se separate or does it simply just depend on the people involved? I, I think it's a personal opinion. Yeah. Um, in my experience, I think the women do better, feel better about their decision when they meet the families. They have a face, they have a concept of where this child's going to be, not just out in a black hole somewhere. Um, 
but there are others that are comfortable that yes. really want it closed and th and I think that's how they deal with it but it's not unusual for someone to say I don't want photos and letters and three years later call us and say sure do you think you can ask them for some photos and so we have families send photos every year anyway now so we have something for her when that time comes yeah. private adoption is about individual choice and and if they've decided not to have that contact you need to also respect that choice right. so there are some adopting families that really don't want to know the adoptive mother and don't want to necessarily be with her during the stages of her pregnancy. Well, they wouldn't it's be matched. Yes. Yeah, they wouldn't be matched. If, oh, that's if, right. if birth yeah. mother wants an open, a more open birth arrangement, mom's choice. then adoptive family has to be open to that. If birth mom wants no oh. contact, then it's a family that's willing to accept that kind of adoption. We would not do justice for our clients if they came no. to us and said, we want no contact. I can't guarantee that. A birth mother may say, I want no contact, and then after she's had her child, before she signed her consents, she may say, I'd like to meet them. I want pictures and letters. I really feel that that's necessary, and an adoptive parent should be open yeah, to that. Yeah, it's not static. No. A have either of you run into the woman who's doing it for profit, for per pure gain? I think we run into them. Yeah, not um, I don't think that they are doing adoption placements. Um, I think that... Um, they're doing it, placing an ad in the newspaper, and they're... There, there are certain... They're under the radar of the legal system, in other words. There are certain people out there that are trying to take advantage of the financial uh, living expenses that mm -hmm. are out there. Um, and that's a shame because you're taking advantage of a client who has a certain budget for their adoption. And as somebody defrauds them and depletes that budget, they have less available in order to complete a successful adoption plan, complete their dream of a child. There's nothing more significant than that. Yeah. How do these uh, mothers find either of you? Through all the medias and you know, newsprint, yellow pages, internet. Referrals from doctors. Social workers, midwives. Yeah. And Nick, how has Safe Haven grown? Because I know you started out small and now you're throughout the state of Florida. Right. How did you get it out there and how do they find you? Well, they find us through our website. They find us through our public service announcements. For, we have some billboard promotions. We have uh, flyers, posters, brochures. We have, we're in, t in the school systems. Um, we, g we have a speakers bureau. Uh, everybody's a volunteer in, all of the, uh, in, in everything that we do. And I'd also like to say we have a helpline. We have a 24-7 referral helpline. Mm -hmm. It's uh, English, Spanish, and Creole. We receive many calls on the helpline from, from girls and women that want to know more about the Safe Haven Law, want to utilize it, or they have, uh, they're in crisis. And so we have a referral database. We're not counselors and we don't give any counseling whatsoever, but we have a referral database uh, and we're able to tap into whatever county that they're calling from to get them help in their, in their particular county. And that's been very helpful. Sometimes the girls uh, call us that are eight months pregnant, have not had any medical care yeah. at, at all. We get them the medical care through the, through the Medicaid program, Medicare program, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and so we're able to help them in that way. So I would think doctors would be or nurses would be a good source of referral also, but obviously if they're not seeking medical treatment, that's... Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot they're not getting. Th there's a lot they're not getting, right. Yeah. We, we've done a few trainings with hospitals and, uh, in adoption, and, and sure. part of that training is to give them the particulars of the safe haven law, too, so if they come across it, they'll know what to do for that patient or client. The, Absolutely. The other thing is that we have uh, safe haven signs posted outside of all the 24-7 uh, fire stations in yeah. the state. I've Over 2,000 of them posted uh, there. And we've sent the uh, work with the Florida Fire Chiefs Association with their procedures on the policies of what to do, and also with all the hospitals statewide. And they have signed, m many of them have signs posted outside their facility as well. Well, that's great. I, I wish we weren't out of time. I think you all have wonderful experience and probably a few tears every now and then with some of the people, but that's very nice. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for joining us as well. Thank you. All right, so here's my question. <laughs>